We now get to lift our voices together in song. If you'll stand with me, we'll sing the song Across the Lands. You're the word of God, the whole earth, from before the world began. Every star and every planet has been fashioned by your hand. All creation. And in the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that shall never be destroyed, nor shall the kingdom be left to another people. It shall break in pieces all these kingdoms and bring them to an end, and it shall stand forever. Let's sing, Jesus shall reign. Bye. 
I hear the scripture that Brother Steve read this morning in 1 Corinthians 1, I always think of two things, just, you know, I'm probably stranger than most. But we preach Christ crucified. I grew up reading Spurgeon's sermons. This was pre-internet, pre-computer. I'm lucky that we had transistors back then. But I had these books, and books of Spurgeon's sermons, and that motto of his in the Metropolitan Tabernacle, where I've been, by the way, uh, I attended a service in the Metropolitan Tabernacle uh, in London, a Wednesday night service. But there's still a church that preaches Christ crucified there. Uh, The facade of the building is there. The rest was bombed out in World War II. But we got to attend a service there. But I remember that motto being on the spine of every single book. We preach Christ crucified. That's what we do here as well. Now, I'm going to preach a sermon this morning on giving, Christian giving. I'm going to finish up some stuff we started here a couple weeks ago on a Wednesday night. But do you know that even in that, we preach Christ crucified? It is the motivation for all we do. It is the center of our Christian life. So I think about that. And then that verse is in there that uh, Queen Elizabeth talked about. I remember reading a long time ago, and I hope I have my facts straight on this. My wife says, don't mess up if you talk about history, because everybody's going to check on you immediately with their phones. So uh, I don't know. I hope I'm not messing up. But it was Queen Elizabeth that said she owed her salvation to the letter M. And it was from the, one of these verses that uh, Brother Steve read this morning. Not many mighty, not many noble. That's what she said. It doesn't say not any. It says not many. And she said, because I'm the queen, I would have to say I owe my salvation to that one letter. So I, re- I remember stuff like this that I've read in the past. And we are going to read another passage today from Paul's letters to the Corinthians, but we're going to 2 Corinthians. So if you would, please, let's turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 8. And because I don't want to try to bite off more than I can chew, we'll stop at verse 9. So verses 1 to 9. If you want to prepare yourself mentally, I have seven points this morning. That sounds terrible, doesn't it? But we'll try to go through them quickly. And two of them we've already covered last Wednesday night, so we will be there briefly. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, I want to read verses 1 to 9. If you want to read the whole story... You have to read chapter 8 and chapter 9 about this collection that uh, Paul was overseeing for the poor saints in Jerusalem. So let's start. 2 Corinthians 8, verse 1. Moreover, brethren, we do you to wit of the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia, how that in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and... Their deep poverty abounded unto the riches of their liberality. For to their power I bear record, yea, and beyond their power, they were willing of themselves, praying us with much entreaty that we would receive the gift and take upon us the fellowship of the ministering to the saints." And this they did not as we had hoped, but first gave their own selves to the Lord and unto us by the will of God. Insomuch that we desired Titus, that as he had begun, so he would also finish in you the same grace also. Therefore, as ye abound in everything, in faith, in utterance, in knowledge, and in all diligence, And in your love to us, see that ye abound in this grace also. I speak not by commandment, but by occasion of the forwardness of others, and to prove the sincerity 
of your love. For ye know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that ye through his poverty might be rich. There's Christ crucified. The last verse we're going to consider today. I was absolutely thrilled to walk in here this morning because I wasn't here last Sunday. I was in West Baden, Indiana, uh, down at Shepherd's Bethel. If you don't know what that is, look them up online. Um, It's a fantastic ministry that provides housing for missionaries that are on deputation or on furlough. And I have been associated with them for a long time. We were trying to figure out how long, and uh, Brother Mike Weiss couldn't figure it out. It's probably a you know, psychological problem with the, the horror of repression there. He's, he's probably sorry for all the years I've been there, but uh, we've been there a long time and been on the board of directors there, and we had a board meeting, so I went down there. And I didn't know what happened last Sunday and what's happened this week, but I come in here and the top is blown off the tube for the missions giving. I, I was thrilled to see that. And whoever had the idea of putting all the cotton balls all over the table, that's pretty cool. I like that one. Uh, so if that was your idea, congratulations to you. I looked up at the ceiling. There was no dent in the ceiling. So that was a little bit disappointing because what I wanted to see is the top blow off so hard it would go up and put a dent up there above it. But I am thrilled to see that. Uh, you know, of course, as a preacher, I'm never satisfied. And we're not in five figures yet, right? So we have today to fix that problem. But when we spoke a couple Wednesdays ago, and I lose track of time, don't know when it was, we started in this passage. And I want to summarize what we did there and then move on to the things we couldn't get to just for time's sake. So all of our points today begin with Christian giving is, and we're going to look at the things this passage suggests, um, and There is so much more here than what we're going to cover this morning, but I trust that what we say will be helpful to you. This is, you know, the preacher is always a little bit hesitant to speak on giving. So it's better that somebody like I am, I can come in and I preach for Brother Kyle, and I can tell you to to give and do just what the Bible says, but it doesn't sound like he's He's uh, got self-interest in mind. I assure you that would be completely far from the case, although later in the message, we're going to show you somebody that absolutely had self-interest in mind when he talked about giving. But today, I want to start with point number one, which says Christian giving is a work of God's grace. If you look at verse one of this passage... Paul tells the Corinthian church that the churches over in Macedonia gave because God's grace was at work in those churches' activities, hearts, lives. Christian giving is a work of God's grace. And we don't give like the world gives. Uh, I hope we don't. We don't call into a telethon and get our name put up on the screen you know, you're a, you're a copper giver. No, you're a silver giver. No, you're gold. Oh, you're platinum. You know, uh, and you get your name put in different spots, and you are recognized for what you give, and you get put on a brick in the walk of glory somewhere that you don't know and you'll never visit. I don't know what. But we don't give to be philanthropic. Now, there's nothing wrong with being philanthropic. You should have that feeling. In fact, Christians should be more philanthropic than anybody on the face of the earth. But we give because God's grace has worked in our hearts, and that's why we give. That's why we give the missions offering, and by the way, that's why we should give to this offering for the coffees. We ought to give to that. Um, you, You know, it was God's will somehow that things worked out the way they did. And they still have needs that need to be met. The team does. So you could give to that. Um, 
Remember when the Lord said, when he was about to go and be crucified, he said, the Son of Man goes as it has been determined of him. I mean, he, God had determined that he was going to be crucified. But he knew that Judas was going to betray him, and he said, but woe to that man by whom he's betrayed. It would have been better for him if he had never been born. Well, you have that mystery of the sovereignty of God and the actions of men at work there. And what works in the negative, we know from Scripture, also works in the positive. Do I believe that God is going to meet the needs of the coffee team? Or do I think that they're going to be sitting beside the road destitute? You know, we'll work for food. Um, I don't think that's going to happen. My, my goofy daughter has decided we're going to have a Grinch theme at Christmas. So I am supposed to dress up in some kind of shirt that has a Grinch thing on it. Okay, I am not a have a Grinch themed thing and all dress in weird green color stuff. I think, well, that's really stupid. Although I do like the book, all right? So she has decided, she has this shirt for me, has Grinch hand here, Grinch hand here, and there's a can in the center and the t-shirt says, we'll work for who hash. But okay, I'll wear that. That's not too bad, a can of who hash. I've never really had a who hash, uh, but I guess I would work for who hash. And you know, the coffee team's not going to be sitting beside the road. We'll work for food. God's going to meet their need, but it would be a blessing for you to be part of that provision, part of the will of God in meeting that need. Just like it was a curse to Judas to be opposed to Jesus Christ and betray him, It'll be a blessing to you as a Christian. And I looked in the bulletin today, and I saw in the bulletin today that we are behind budget. And I heard Steve say that in the business meeting. And what better time than at Christmas to give extra to your church? Get us caught up on our budget, meet all those needs, and go forward triumphantly. You know, if we had more tubes back there, I'd like to see the tops blown off more. That'd be fantastic. So I realize that I'm sort of preaching to the choir here because you folk are here and you're already interested in Christian giving, but you know what I've found in years in the pastorate is that's exactly who you ought to preach to. The people who are not doing are not going to do unless God completely changes their hearts. It's the people who are already serving the Lord, and whose hearts are already surrendered, that love hearing God's word, and they even like sermons on giving. And you're going to find out why as we go through this. So, the number one thing here is that giving is a work of God's grace. Number two, uh, giving, Christian giving, is independent of circumstances. Paul says these churches in Macedonia were absolutely persecuted and they were impoverished. They could not rub two denariuses together. You know, they, they were in bad shape. But they gave, number one, what they could give. And number two, they gave more than they could give. And uh, we, we went over that on the Wednesday night, so I'm going to leave it with that. But all you have to do is meet those two standards, and you don't have any worries about not doing what God wants you to do. Do what you can. And obviously, several people have. And we have a, a good offering to give to missions, and we're going to get slightly better than this, I believe. I believe it'll be five digits, and maybe you know, up a little higher than, than not six digits. Okay, I'm not, we're, not, we're not shooting for that. Um, yeah, I, I don't have that much faith either. But we, we are going to give to the missionaries, and we're going to do so because people are willing to sacrifice. I read a story, this is not my personal experience, but I read it in a commentary I had, uh, a missionary related the story that a businessman came from the U.S. to look at the mission field. And this was in Korea when this missionary was serving in Korea. Uh, it would have been South Korea. So the businessman came from the U.S. and was walking around the village with the missionary. 
he wanted to see what God was doing there and, you know, probably had a little bit of thought in the back of his head, well, we're checking up on how our money's being spent over here, which is okay, but it's not when it's mixed with arrogance. But uh, he was over there and the missionary said they were walking along and they saw a man out in the field, an old man with a plow and a young man at the front of the plow with the harness on pulling the plow. It was his son. And the businessman was so taken by that that he stopped and got a picture of it. And he says, I I just can't believe what life is like here in Korea. These people must be extremely poor. And the missionary said, well, yes and no. He says, they go to our church. And they used to have an ox to pull the plow. But when we were raising money to build the church, they sold the only ox they had because they didn't have any money to give. And the son said he would pull the plow through this entire year until hopefully they could afford to buy another ox. Now that's sacrifice. You know, that... And what the missionary related was that it's so... He said the businessman just stopped and was silent. And he related that later the businessman wrote him and told him, I went home and I doubled my giving to the church. He said, I told my pastor, he says, I have never given to the point that it ever hurt me. That I was actually sacrificing for the cause of Christ. And these churches in Macedonia did that. They gave to the point of sacrifice. They gave what they could and beyond what they could. All right, we went over these in a little more detail before. Let's look at number three. Christian giving is the normal desire of surrendered people. People who are Christians and surrendered to the will of God. Look at verses four and five. Praying us with much entreaty that we would receive the gift and take upon us the fellowship of the ministering to the saints. And this they did not as we had hoped, but first gave of their own selves unto the Lord, and unto us by the will of God. It's not too often that you get begged to take an offering. Please, please take an offering. Now I expect, Brother Paul, you know, after this money is raised and done, sent to missionaries, Maybe you'll, you'll go over to Paul and say, can we start even earlier next year? Can we get the, uh, you know, I want to raise even more next year. Please let us give to me. Can we give all year long? Can we, you know, um, will you, and this was the kind of enthusiasm that was there in the Macedonian churches. They were surrendered to the Lord and they wanted to give. They didn't have to be asked to give. It was in their heart. And I believe that Because it's a work of God's grace, it has its source in anyone's heart that knows the grace of God in truth. If I recognize what has been done for me, I cannot help but want to give to the cause of Christ. I can't help it. It's there. So I don't have to worry about getting up and preaching about it. You know, before this is over, I might even hear an amen. It's possible. Okay? It's possible. I about said even in a Baptist church, but even in a Bible church. (laughs) These people were thrilled to be able to give, and that was part of exactly what they wanted. And remember, they are poor. But the thing that has always been true in the Christian church is that if you won't give when you're poor, you won't give when you're rich. That's always been true. Poor people give. Uh, The church that uh, I was in in Coatesville, this was a small church. I mean, the number of people we have here today would have been a record in Coatesville. We would have have made the local paper, but of course there wasn't one. But uh, it was a small church. But over and over and over again, we would have missionaries come to our church and we would always take up an offering for them when they came. And I guarantee you that over the time I was there, I had at least 15 missionaries tell me 
This is the biggest offering I've got this whole year from 40 people, a church of 40 people. And they said, I said, you're kidding. I said, wouldn't you get, if you went to such and such a church, wouldn't you get two, $3,000? They said, no, big churches don't give. And I thought, that's really strange. But the missionaries were consistent in their testimony. And it wasn't just that it was a small church that gave a lot, but it was that the people had a heart for missions. That's what it was. And so they gave because it was their normal thing to do. And they didn't, they didn't give the money they would normally give to the church. That's separate. That's something different. They, they gave a special offering. They gave the money that they were going to use to do something else with. And they sacrificed. And the missionaries would get good offerings at our church. And I just thank the Lord the whole time I was there for that. What a privilege that was to be with people that felt that way. And it is normal. Just let me note here that if giving is a work of God's grace... And if it is normal for surrendered Christians to want to give, what's the condition of your heart if you don't want to give? I think it is logical to assume that there's something wrong with the work of grace in your heart. There, It is logical to assume that you don't appreciate what Jesus Christ has done for you if it is not your constant internal desire to give. To do what the Lord Jesus Christ would be honored with. And then we'll move on. I've sort of hit these three last Wednesday. So let's go to number four. If you look at verse six, it says, Insomuch that we desire Titus, that as he had begun, so he would also finish in you the same grace as well. Christian giving is only helpful if it is actual. You can talk a good, a good game, but it's the doing of it that matters, isn't it? A lot of people talk. Uh, you know the old saying, when all's said and done, there's a lot more said than done. And we need to be careful that we don't do the same thing as believers. Uh, some verses that I'm sure you'll recognize here. So go to James 2, book of James, chapter 2. Titus, Philemon, Hebrews, James. Chapter 2. Let's read the passage here, beginning in verse 14. James 2, 14. What does it profit, my brethren... Though a man say he hath faith and have not works, can faith save him? Now, this is not an absolute question. We believe we're saved by grace through faith. That's what we believe. But what James is asking here, can that kind of faith, in quotes, save him? A faith that doesn't work. A faith that doesn't show anything on the outside. Verse 15. If a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you say to them, Depart in peace. Be ye warmed and filled. Amen. That sounds spiritual, doesn't it? I had to work on that for a while this morning. You know, I mean, preachers ought to be able to say it that way. Depart in peace. Be ye warmed and filled. And those were normal greetings, uh, well wishes, part of that society. But James says, notwithstanding ye give them not the things which are needful to the body, what profit? What good is that? Is exactly the idea in James' expression there. Even so faith, if it hath not works, is dead being alone. You know, it's great that you would say to somebody, brother, I know you've got a problem, and I'm going to pray for you. Well, good for you. And if you tell them that, you better pray for them. What I have developed the habit of doing, because I have a weak brain, is when I tell somebody I'm going to pray for them, I pray for them right then. Okay? So I, I, I bow my head and ask God to meet that need right then, because I might forget in the future. That's possible. Other weak-brained people have done the same thing, right? 
I did get an amen out of that. Okay, so I got one. Um, but if you tell somebody you're going to pray for them, that's a good thing. But James here says you can wish people well, but it would be a whole lot more helpful if you'd go over there and help them with the things that are the problem in their house. If you would take out your wallet and give them some money so that they could have their needs met. James says your faith has to be the kind of faith that works. Christian giving is only helpful if you actually do it and you fulfill what you propose. I don't know if you've ever been in a church that had what they call faith promise giving. It's just a way that people give, okay? I have no problem with it. It's not the only way to give. It's fine. Um, some people call it grace giving. Some people pledge to give a certain amount, and that's fine. One way or the other, it's all good. But I know that many things are promised that are not performed. And Christian giving needs to be performed. Especially if you were sitting in a service and the Lord touched your heart and the Lord said, well, you could do better than you're doing now. You could do this, you could do that. And you know God's Holy Spirit's convicting. If that happens, then, then get the job done. Give. Do it. If the Lord has spoken to your heart already from these verses right here, said, here's what you ought to do. You got that money sitting at home for a new whoa, whoa, whoa. You don't need a new one. You're, the one you have now is perfectly good. Take that money and give to these needs. You know about the need. Meet the need. Christian giving is helpful when it is actual. And when James says it doesn't do any good to wish well, but not do well, we understand that, don't we? We understand that. Okay, go back to 2 Corinthians 8. Number five. This is an amazing verse. Verse seven. Therefore, as ye abound in everything, and look at this catalog of wonderful Christian virtues in faith. Do you trust God? If you don't trust God, you're not saved. If you don't trust God, you're disobedient. Do you know that the only thing that's going to send you to hell is refusing to believe God? That's what's going to send you to hell. If you believe God, that's the difference between an unbeliever and a believer. It's good that these Corinthians abounded in faith, in utterance, the, the ability to speak for God. Do you speak for God? I hope you do. I mean, you know, you, you don't have to preach a whole sermon, but you have to tell what God's done for you. And if somebody at work makes some comment, if somebody at school makes some comment that's disparaging to the Bible, that's disparaging to God, your mouth ought to open right away. And in love, you should say, what needs to be said. You should speak for God. And that's a good Christian virtue. Remember, it's not about you. You say, oh, I'd be embarrassed. I'd be embarrassed to speak. It's not about you. You're an ambassador for Christ. It's your job to speak for the Lord. So open your mouth and say what needs to be said in a kind and gentle way. Speak the truth in love. But speak. And the Corinthians did that. They abounded in utterance. Then it says, in knowledge. Well, we want that, don't we? Grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior. We want to abound in knowledge. And Paul says, you Corinthians do that. You know God's word. Good, that's good. And he says, in addition to knowledge, he says, diligence, zealousness. It is good to be zealously affected always in a good thing. Paul tells us. You should have zeal for the Lord. Don't be sluggish and languorous and boring and slow and barely able to do anything for the Lord. Show some zeal. You have something to be zealous about. Kim had a, my daughter Kim, had a Chinese teacher um, 
that used to tell them, you have to show enthusiasm. So that's what we ask of Christians. You show enthusiasm. And be zealous in what you do for the Lord. The Corinthians were. And they were diligent. They showed energy and in love. And this whole relationship between Paul and the Corinthians is spoken about there, how he loved them and they loved Paul. And they abounded in that. But Paul said, all of these things are good, but unless you abound in this grace, you have fallen short. He says, see that you abound in this grace also. The grace of giving completes all of these other graces. If you have faith, you'll give. If you speak for God, you'll be a giving person. If you are diligent, if you are zealous, if you are loving, you'll give. This grace is listed right in there with all these wonderful Christian virtues. And Paul said it's just as important as any of these others. It's not something you should learn to do later when you're more wealthy, when God has blessed you more. You know, it's something that should be done right now. The grace of giving is as important as these. It's like these lists that list all these horrible sins that Paul does more than once in the Bible. He talks about uh, th these horrible sins that people are involved in, the, 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 uh, the sexual sins and the sins of greed and the sins of idolatry and all these different sins. And then he says, and covetousness at the end. Just as bad as those others. Covetousness. Well, this is surprising like that. You have all these Christian graces, and Paul says, and giving. Do that too. That's just as important as your faith. Just as important as the other things that God has led you to do. And then, number six, Christian giving is the outflow of God's love in our hearts. If you will look at verse 8, I speak this not by commandment. Paul, Paul, Paul could command them. But then their giving is simply obedience. If Paul impels them to give because he points out the love that was in other Christians' hearts and points to the love in their heart, he says, I speak this not by commandment, but by occasion of the forwardness of others. He was pointing out the giving that other Christians had done. And he said, I want to demonstrate that your love is sincere. It's the real deal. It has the proper credentials. There's a verse in 1 John, a couple of verses. Let's have you turn there. 1 John chapter 3. 1 John chapter 3. Look at verse 16. Hereby perceive we the love of God, because he laid down his life for us. And we ought also, the word ought means we are obligated to as well. It is necessary for us to do this. That's what the, the word in the original language means. He says, we are required to lay down our lives for the brethren. So what does that mean? Lay down your life for the brethren. Well, look at the next verse. But whoso hath this world's good, and seeth his brother have need, and shutteth up his bowels of compassion from him, how dwelleth the love of God in him? First John, it's one of these books that you better be prepared when you go to read it, because it's tough on you. First John gets you right here. And he says here, you're telling me that you're a Christian, that God's love is in your heart, but you're not giving to help your brothers? You're a liar. God's love isn't in your heart if you don't help others, if you don't give. What kind of Christian are you? There's no love of God there. How dwells the love of God? In him. Verse 18, my little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. That's the only kind of love that counts. Just like the only kind of doctrine that counts is the doctrine that affects your life 
and changes what you do. The only kind of love that counts is the love where you actually do something about it. Paul says, I want to show other people that your love is genuine. That's what he said to the Corinthians. And how's he going to show them that? If the Corinthians finish this offering and take this collection for people they didn't even know. I had to look this up. But you know how far it is from Corinth to Jerusalem? It's 821 miles. And that's across the Mediterranean Sea. Do you know it is most unlikely that anybody in the church at Corinth knew anybody in the church at Jerusalem? But they had been told that these brothers and sisters in Christ needed help. And it didn't matter if they knew them or not. They didn't get the blood is thicker than water comment. They got their wallets out. And in Romans chapter 15, we find out from Paul that the Corinthians did give. They gave to help these people that needed it. Then lastly, look at number seven. Oops, I'm in 1 John. Get back there. Verse nine. For ye know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, Christian love is Christ-like, Though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that ye through his poverty might be rich. Here's our example. This is always the final reason. This is always the bottom line to everything we do. Because of what Jesus has done for us. We love him, why? Because he first loved us. If, if that's not your main motivation, then you'll never do what God wants you to do. There are wrong motivations to give. And I would spend more time with this, but I have to go quickly. I brought my envelope today. Here's my envelope. A long time ago, I don't know, 25, 30 years ago, I got a card in the mail. Let me see if I can get it out of here. Got a card in the mail from a preacher, and that preacher said, bro goggler, like he knew me, okay, do you need anything, are you sick, do you need money, well, of course I didn't need money, I was a preacher, <laughs> so uh, I didn't need money, he said, if you will send me a gift of $20, I will send you a fantastic gift where the light of Christ can shine on your life. And you will get the things you need. Well, I thought, well, let's see what this guy's got. So I wrote him a letter, and I said, I can't give any money right now, which was absolutely true. Not only was I dead solid broke, but I wasn't going to give it to a con man anyway. Uh, but I said, I'd still like the nightlight that you advertised. So here it is. He sent it to me. This preacher did. So I said to my wife, wow, we got this nightlight with Jesus' picture on it. Every problem we have is going to be solved. So I took the nightlight and went and plugged it in. It didn't work. <laughs> he sent me one that was burnt out, okay, because I didn't send him any money. But what happened because of that is I got on the most interesting mailing list you've ever seen. And I brought some stuff to show you. I'm going to do it quickly. He sent me stuff all the time, wanting me to do this and that for him. And, um, you know, he'd send me, oh, here's his picture. He'd send me stuff and tell me, you know, that, oh, I got to do that in a second. Let's do this one first. He sent me this, told me that if I would send him a gift of $20, $40 or something, he sent me a holy spot right here. And I was told that if I would stand on this holy spot with my shoes off, because it was a holy spot, I had to take my shoes off. And then I would ask God for however much money I wanted. Then I have to fold this up, give him an offering, 
send this holy spot back to him, one of his cronies would stand on the holy spot too and pray for me to get what I wanted. And then he'd have his testimony of so-and-so got 11 acres in New Jersey. I think that'd be more of a curse than a blessing. And then so-and-so got $4,800. So-and-so got this and that. The holy spot. Then I got, uh, and I'm only going to show you a couple more because I got this because he wanted to lay hands on me. There's, there's this guy's hand. It's a shower cap. And all you have to do is put this on when you take a shower, send him a gift of so many dollars, pray what this cap on while he's laying his hand on your head and money would be coming to you hand over fist. Matter of fact, I got two of these. So if any of you need one, <laughs> I could probably loan you one. I got a, I got, I can't show you everything, but I, I got a cloth, a prayer cloth, and then this is the pièce de résistance. Okay? Here is my super quality prayer rug with a picture of Jesus on it. And on this one, if I will send him an offering of $77.77, because seven is the number of perfection, and then I get up at one in the morning by myself in my bedroom and kneel on this prayer rug in dim light, he says, Jesus' eyes are closed, but I'm supposed to pray and stare at it until Jesus opens his eyes. And when he opens his eyes, I'll get whatever I'm asking for. But I have to take the prayer rug and I have to send it back to him with my offering and then he will bless me and I'll get all that. Folks, and I have, a, see this? It weighs about five pounds. And I, I have so much stuff in here. This is the wrong motivation for giving. He was telling me to give so I could get. That's what he was telling me. And if you as a Christian do that, you are just as wrong as that guy is. We don't give so we can get. We give because we esteem others better than ourselves. We give out of love for our Savior. We give because the greatest gift in the possible universe has been given to us. And that is the gift of salvation because Jesus Christ loved us and died on the cross to save us. Totally selfless. Selfless. Our Christian giving has to be the same way. So I encourage you. I get to preach while the, while the pastor's sick. We hope he, if he's watching at home, he may be sicker right now. I don't know. But I encourage you to, to give because God has changed your heart. Give because there are genuine needs. Give, you know, give more. We can buy more cotton balls. We can spill them all over the floor next week if we have to. Give because that's the only possible response to everything you have received from God. There's nothing better than that. Let's make sure our hearts are aligned with the heart of our Savior and be giving Christian people. Let's stand for prayer. Patrick. I found guilty to be pardoned by the blood of Christ the Lamb, and I'm welcome.